Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, we're going to start. Uh, my name is Brian Call. I'm the chair for the session. I'm from IT Sligo. Uh, my colleague Gavin Clinch couldn't uh, make it this morning, so he apologizes. So if you actually just came here to see the chair, you will be disappointed. Uh, so our first speaker uh, this morning is Dave White from the University of the Arts, London. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, what it takes, as you can see there, to establish openness as an institutional value. And uh, his colleague, uh, Kate, who um, is logging in online. I don't know, are we streaming? Maybe I shouldn't say there was a visa issue, but uh, that hasn't happened yet. So uh, she couldn't make it today. <laughs> uh, so I'll hand back to Dave. Hi, thank you. Yes, uh, so uh, it's this, this, this follows on from uh, Kate's keynote. So obviously, yeah, I'm Dave White from University of Arts London. Kate Lindsay uh, from the University College of Estate Management couldn't be here today, but this is very much as a kind of co-production, so I'm going to speak to her parts of it. Um, if you're interested in, in those elements of the talk, then do go to her blog and get in touch with her, um, because there's, she's doing great work there. Um, this really kind of comes off the back of Kate's keynote. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to do this a lot to keep the guy on the camera busy, okay? <laughs> Hello, people online. Um, because um, it was that idea of openness kind of revealing itself in, in our institutions, and that's very much what this is about, is, is how do we um, bring openness in from the peripheries, if you like. And that's the track that we're working in, which is bringing open in from the periphery. And whilst my institution and Kate's institution are very different, we're both trying to do that in, in, in slightly different ways, okay? Now, what I'm going to ask you to do, because this is like an open space session, is I'm going to ask you to go to that link there, tinyurl.com oer19culture. It would have been oer19, but somebody had already taken that, which wasn't a surprise, really. Um, there's a Google Doc on the end of that, and I'm going to ask you, while I'm sort of talking, to respond to this question in that document, okay? So I'm going to show you the question now. If somebody could tweet that URL, I'd be very grateful, okay? It will be on the next slide, don't panic. See, it's still there, it's just slightly less clear. Um, so this is the question I'd like you to consider, because in a way it's the question that myself and Kate are considering, and are in, in the process of considering, which is, what are the key factors in moving your institution towards a culture of openness? And there are just some rules in terms of responding to that question, not to make it difficult, just to give it a kind of a frame. Um, you, you can talk to important people. You are sat at the important people table. I thought it was really interesting, Kate, talking about the expanded university and the system. You know, the system does, the system is still people as well. So you're at that table, okay, if you want to be. You can make policy, you can change process, you can take risks, but you don't have magic money, okay? So the, the idea there is you're not expanding the expanded university even more. Your response to the question has to be, um, ways of incorporating openness into existing practice, if you like. Okay. Certainly at my institution, the answer to most things is we should get together and talk about this more. And that's expensive. And so I'm asking you to think about ways that it could, it could come in from the periphery, if you like. So I'm going to go to that Google Doc about halfway through the session for a discussion. So please do put something in it, otherwise that will be awkward. I think you probably are, which is why everybody's super focused. That's good. I'm going to let you get on with that. OK, so just some background. So myself and Kate have done quite a lot of open type stuff over the years. This is a good example from Kate where she um, ran uh, this project that gathered, um, like, if you like, primary and social documentation that people had in their attics and in bottom drawers and stuff like that around World War One, and that was, uh, they got 700,000 bits of stuff from people all over the UK, put that online, lots of Creative Commons licensing, so huge, open, very connected project. Um, an example from me, I mean, a few years ago I did um, Pi Day Live, which had, uh, I think, about 2,000 school children from 27 different countries all logging in at the same time. Uh, and then this project here, which I did recently with um, Bon Stewart, uh, which was a series of, of completely open online seven seminars around the subject of teaching complexity. And this is one of the kind of live slides that, that, that's part of that. 
But I think what's interesting about both of those is, is whilst they're excellent projects, in some senses they're, they're, they're on the periphery. Because certainly, I've, ne I've never had anybody at my institution say, how come you aren't doing more open seminars? You know, if those projects hadn't existed, um, then there wouldn't necessarily have been anybody hunting us down to say, where's that project, if you see what I mean. So this is uh, Univ the University College of Estate Management. Um, this is uh, Kate's institution where she's a senior learning designer. And uh, it's useful to know that they're a fully online institution. They've obviously got a kind of industry focus uh, because of the nature of the institution. A lot of part-time students uh, working. They're very flexible in terms of who they accept. Uh, so they're open in that sense. And they're also flex flexible in terms of if people want to sort of back off from their education and then get back into it, OK? Um, and they, I think it's fair to say that up until now, they, obviously they're online, but their, their model, if you like, their educational model was, was fairly correspondence-y in essence. And so Kate's looking to um, refresh that with a, a, an education, a new educational framework. So this, obviously, in a session that's half an hour long, I can't go through this in detail. So you can, you can visit her blog to find out more about that. But I think it's an interesting situation, because obviously, if you've got a fully online institution, then you can sort of control or frame the way that curriculum is designed. And uh, in terms of bringing openness in from the periphery and establishing it as a, an institutional value, this bit of the diagram here, that sort of area there, is where um, there are going to be sort of open or learning designs that uh, have inherent open practice in them. So that's one way, that's, that's a kind of one way that you can start to bring it in in, in terms of curriculum design. Now for me, that's a bit tricky because I, I come from a big arts university, 20,000 students, and I can't um, control how curriculum is designed, not to that extent, if you like. So talking with uh, Catherine Cronin about this, actually, uh, I was encouraged to go in the direction of, of, of trying to establish some open, I don't know if you'd call them principles or if you'd call them values, at, for, at the center of the university, if you like. And so ran a couple of workshops with staff to sort of develop these values and to really kind of condense them down. So you can see in terms of openness, I'm t I, we're talking about things that sort of go beyond the making, making content open. This is, this, is, this is more fundamental than that in some senses. And the reason that I wanted to do this was because it struck me that the staff at the university, they didn't know what the university thought about open practice, if I can use that frame, that sort of phrasing. Um, and so I wanted to kind of reveal, or at least maybe nudge the university in a certain direction and say, well, actually, no, we think openness is good and we think it looks like this, okay? And that might lead to two things. One would be that the people that are already working in open ways would actually reveal that they were working in open ways. One of the ironies I find about this form of practice is that the teaching uh, practitioners who work in open, uh, in the character of open, if you like, quite often try and do it under the radar because they're worried that the institution will say that they're not allowed to do it, okay? So I'm trying to create a space where they could say, oh, actually, I'm, I'm already doing some of this. Let's talk about it. And then the other thing is that it would encourage people to head in this direction. So that's, that's where we've got to with those. I can't say I've been incredibly successful with that um, at, up to this point. I, I talked about it uh, as part of a committee paper, and it wasn't universally well received. And I can totally see why. I think one of the reasons was because of the way I presented it, which wasn't excellent, uh, I think people were like, well, we've got to do all of this, and we've got to be open. <laughs> it's like, it, seemed, it just seemed like another thing to have to do, which is, in a way, was part of the genesis of this session, which is, how do you make it part of the fabric of the institution rather than yet another thing that you have to do on top of everything else? So I just want to um, focus on the Connects the Diversity of Voices just for a second, and then we'll come back around to that document and have a bit of a discussion, I hope. Um, this was the, the, the trickiest one and the most interesting one. That phrasing was going to be um, 
facilitates or invites at one point, and I ended up with connects uh, for this reason, okay? And I think that it, you know, this has come up, but it, uh, it's really important to me that openness doesn't become, hey, we're going to invite you into our club. But actually, openness is more about connecting different voices and the university kind of being a site of exchange for those voices. Along these lines here. And I like the idea of complexity. I'm not sure to what extent the students like the idea of complexity, but I think that's an interesting discussion. Okay. So what suddenly began to, to uh, intrigue me about this, and in discussing this with Kate to put the session together, is that I realized that, what, that one of the main motivations for, one of the main institutional motivations to uh, support open practice you know, directly was as a kind of performance of surplus. Right? So this is a really useful blog post from Richard Hall, uh, where he's describing what, what, I mean, it's a useful quote in terms of what I'm saying surplus is. Richard puts it much better. And it reminded me of this. Has anybody ever seen this documentary from 1974? I think in the UK it used to be part of a schools thing. The undergraduate degree that I used to, that I did that I used to do that I did when I was an undergraduate uh, was uh, had an anthrop anthropology aspect to it, and we watched this documentary, which uh, was about Onka's big mocha, and it just it suddenly reminded me, or, or at least it 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 resonated with me in terms of how institutions sometimes respond to openness in slightly dangerous ways, which is look at us. We're so, we've, we've got the capacity and the confidence and the, and, and the power and the wealth that allows us to give you this open stuff, okay? So instead of it being about connecting a diversity of voices, that's not, that's not the intention, that's the problem, is perhaps the intention comes as a kind of performance of surplus or of power, if you like. And what happens in Onka's Big Mocker, I'm not using this, I'm using this in a sort of Claude Levi-Strauss way, which is sometimes it's useful to look at other cultures because they hold up a mirror to your own. So when thinking about this, I was thinking about our culture as institutions rather than this directly. But a mocker is, is this um, form of exchange in uh, Papua New Guinea whereby uh, big men give gifts, give bunches of gifts to each other and you have, to, you have to give back the same amount of gifts to repay the debt. But if you want to look like a really big man, you give significantly more than what you've been given because that confers status on you. Okay? And so this sentence, now that I've given you all these things, I've won, I've knocked you down by giving so much. I started to worry that that was an institutional motivation for openness. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back to the document. <laughs> a little bit of juggling. Oh, there's tons in there. Right, that's a good thing. I sounded like that was a bad thing, but I was just suddenly mildly daunted because it's like a half an hour session, and oh, that's good. We're halfway through. Excellent. So. I like the way that there's a lot of other thoughts <laughs> in there. I think, that, I think that's uh, very promising. Would anybody like to speak to any of the points that they put in? Anybody like to explain what they put in? Somebody brave. Be brave yeah, be brave, Martin. Uh, so I put the one about, oh, sorry, thank you, Dave. I put the about linking to things that matters to the system, but I'm not sure about this, okay? Uh, I think it links to something that uh, Kate was saying in her presentation uh, about kind of academic labor and things. So I think in some ways, in order for things to count, we have to count them, right? Yeah, okay. But then once you start counting things, you pretty much kill any joy or, or, or niceness about them, you know? So do you fight the counting? So do you kind of play the game and say, like, the point about openness is that 
you know, you can make a good case in the ref, it will increase your citations, it's a good way to improve student retention, or it's a, it's a marketing factor. You can play the game, the kind of, for want of a better phrase, the neoliberal game, you know. But is that a good thing to do, or is that a bad thing? Should, should you be setting up an alternative narrative to that? And I don't have an answer to that, but I think if you, if you just want to kind of make it work in an institution, then selling it to them on the things that matter to them is one way to do that. But I don't know whether that's a bad thing to do. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I found myself, when trying to promote openness in principle, using some of that language. And so I think, you, I think it's important. I personally don't have a problem using that language knowingly, if you like, and using it as a kind of shell to, kind of, to, to bring some healthy practices in. But it's a danger, it's, that's definitely a dangerous business. And for me, there's this interesting tension between network and hierarchy. So, you know, institutions are hierarchical and they measure things in, those, in that sense. But actually, most open practice is distinctly kind of networked in character. And so, bringing in network practices from the periphery into the institution, which is hierarchical, do they, is that inevitably going to kill them on the way in? Yeah? So, I do, yeah, I genuinely think that's a difficult question. For me, it's about trying to reframe what we think value is, if you like. But that's a really big question. Anybody else want to speak to, to the document? Yeah. Can you, can you do some? I could run with the mic, but I feel like I have to stay on. Uh, hopefully, if you're watching on the live stream, then you, you've also had a chance to contribute to the document. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look through this and have a good old think about it and probably post about it afterwards. So all of this work will go somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, so what I put in, in the global south, there is still lack of, uh, uh, there is still lack of, uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, awareness, and um, there is still need to be um, <coughs> increase in the investment in ICT infrastructures. So these has to be in place for the culture of open to be, you know, um, uh, for most in, in institutions in the global south to be really engaged in the culture of open. Okay, yeah, that's a really good point. And to be honest, it wasn't that what you've made me realize a bunch of assumptions I made there, which is I think that, for, for example, in my institution, all of that inf infrastructure is there. So that gives me the opportunity to talk about values. But I think that's a, that's a point well made, that actually um, there are other locations whereby things just haven't quite been plugged in yet, and that, and that infrastructure isn't there. And perhaps that, perhaps that amplifies the danger of that um, openness as a performance of sur surplus problem, you know, that actually being uh, structurally in a position where you can be open is actually a privileged position. And that was, that, that was something that I wanted to say about myself and Kate's roles as well, is that, you know, I, I'm, in, I'm in a permanent contract, and the only reason I could run those uh, teaching complexity seminar series is, one, because I'm in a permanent contract, and two, because I don't have a full teaching load. So actually, I can, uh, you know, I, I can be, I can do open things in a very nice way, because I'm, but in a way that's just emblematic of my privileged position. Okay, so it's it. Thank you for that. That's 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 a useful reminder to me of some assumptions I've made about where I started um, with that. Should I take another one. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Dave. Can I give a plug for our panel at five o'clock this afternoon? As Go well? on. Why some not? Of those things. So yeah. We're talking about um, Jane Secker's uh, module on digital literacy and open practice, but it made me think. So I'm Chris Morrison at the University of Kent. I put down asking enterprise team, those responsible for exploiting IP to create open resources and consider their own practice. And again, this may be something I'm trying to do at Kent. Talk to the people who own the intellectual property policy, who say the university owns everything and are yeah. very concerned about not opening the floodgates. So I'm trying to engage them in that conversation because teachers will come to me and say, uh, or lecturers, can we make open stuff? And I can say, well, I could say, yes, I think it's a good idea, but we don't have a policy and we don't have a position on it. And I think we're quite a, 
conservative, traditional, hierarchical institution. Um, so it's just trying, I don't know if it's going to work, to have that networked idea within the institution to try to create those connections that somehow might help influence that kind of on override the hierarchy that wants to own and control things and come up with something. I don't know whether you have experience of that actually having worked anywhere or whether that sounds a bit like a pipe dream. No, no, I mean, I'm not sure that I can respond to that directly, but I think what you're talking about, I think there's a thing, I mean, maybe this comes back to Martin's point as well, is that what you can do with in, institutional structures is use them to create a space for certain types of practice, which is why I'm interested in those sort of open values. So whilst the culture of the institution might not really understand openness and what its benefits are, and whilst you probably don't want to go down the route, as Martin says, of describing the benefits in a way that perpetuates the system that you're trying to do something about, I do think that you can do things like, like uh, have policies around IP, and policies that perhaps support community practice type, you know, structures that aren't directly, they're, they're kind of, they're not directly supporting openness, but what they're doing is they're kind of cutting a space in the institution for that practice to then emerge. And certainly for the practice to be acknowledged as a thing. Because that, I, I think that's sometimes, you know, the, the starting point is what, what does it take to get to, to help my institution acknowledge that openness is a valid practice, even if what makes it valid doesn't directly play to the, to the value structures of the institution directly, if you like. It's a bit of a knotty response, but... Okay, I'm gonna, yeah. Yeah. So just, just as you were talking there, I think, again, for me, in terms of open practice, just thinking about privilege and position, but actually one of the things that I find about doing things openly, just doing something openly, is actually almost a way to subvert the system as well. And I think you sometimes need that ground up kind of approach as well to get that buy-in, because I, I know in my own institution, although we've got policies and we do have things that sometimes you just have to keep doing things to remind people. So again, just wanted to throw that in. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And in a way, I think you need both. I mean, one of the reasons we put on the teaching complexity was because it was like a show, not tell. It's actually, openness is a really difficult thing to describe, but it's a relatively easy thing to show people. So finding elegant ways of, uh, of communicating something that you've actually done in the language of the institution is quite useful. Otherwise, it becomes very hypothetical, doesn't it? OK, I'm going to move on just because of time. I say just because of time, obviously time is quite a fundamental thing for all of us. But as I say, thank you for engaging in, in the Google Doc. Um, myself and Kate, Kate will look at all of that and, and, and respond to it. I like fighting its neoliberal agenda, exclamation mark, by the way. That's nice and crisp. Um, so, oh, I can't move on in, in a PowerPoint unless I've actually got it up on screen. So let's do that. Okay, so in terms of um, myself and Kate, five minutes, that's about right. I love it when that happens. Okay, um, so these are, these are some of, of, of our responses to that question, if you like. Um, at UAL, um, University of Arts London, we're going to put together some sig signature digital learning designs, that, and some of those will, will inherently have open practice in them. And what's important about those is, is we, we, we're going to ask undergraduate courses to incorporate them into their curriculum, but not as a bolt-on, as switching out practice that they're doing now, if you like. So really, a really simple example, you do five lectures as part of your course, why not do two of them online in something like Blackboard Collaborate or something along those lines? So actually, really quite straightforward things, but the important thing for me is that they're not additional practice, okay? And also, just a debate around openness. I realized when I was talking about the open values at, at uh, the committee I was at that it is actually still quite new to some people as an idea, as a principle. So uh, I've got 
the, the uh, Director of Libraries and Student Services, the Dean of Students and Widening Participation, and the Director of Knowledge Exchange. We're all going to get together and put together a kind of convene an institutional debate just to raise the pro profile and visibility of it. That's kind of breaking my question a little bit because that is sort of additional. And as I say, uh, Kate's got this new educational framework which, has, which is going to be kind of woven into the institution. And also, um, it responds to some new graduate attributes that they've got. And the graduate attributes obviously have things like you're going to be an authentic practitioner in your field and stuff about being connected and networked. So you can respond to that as well uh, as a way of making sure that openness isn't peripheral. So I just want to end on this thought, really, just to try and bring it together. And this comes off the back of the sort of Onka's big mocha um, documentary. And that principle of, of uh, openness, or trying to avoid the institutional response to openness being a demonstration of surplus, is to, and, and to me it came down to this, which is, is a very kind of anthropological sort of statement, is to, to try and ensure as we <coughs> bring openness in from the periphery, that, w that it's based on uh, reciprocity and not redistribution, okay? I think that works as an idea. So that's where that value that I had in the list, you know, connects the diversity of voices. That's, that's kind of what that means, is that it becomes uh, more about a kind of, more about gifts, more about connection, and less about let's marketize openness. Uh, which, in, in some ways, I think was, was, was how do we avoid doing that was the heart of our discussion we just had. So that's just what I want to leave you with. Openness is reciprocity, not redistribution. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, I think we have about a minute for any final questions before we move on to the next. Did I actually finish before the end? Yeah, you get oh, that's start. incredible. No, okay, we no that, yeah, that's good. That was because it was so perfectly it formatted, so yeah. Perfectly timed. Excellent. Well done.